as additions to Alexander Isley papers. And uh, of course, this uh, collection includes designer sketches, drafts, uh, final design pro products, uh, design development documents, and like uh, other records and correspondence and press clippings. And uh, today we are going to uh, unbox uh, some of these materials and also have some question and answer with Alex. So we can start uh, the unboxing. Hi, good morning. My name is Gwen Thayer. I am the interim head of special collections at NC State University Libraries. And with me is Shima. Hello, everyone. I am Shima Hosseini Nesab, a graduate student in public history. So one of the really fun things we get to do is open new donations. Um, and we've cheated a little bit. We have done a little bit of the unwrapping. So we have some acid-free boxes where we have some new materials. Um, the donation we're looking at today is from Alex Isley. He is a graduate of our very own College of Design and a wonderful donor who's been giving us materials um, consistently over the last few years. And this one's really fun because it is about our new Viz Studio at Hill. So um, we're going to open this up a little bit and see what we have. So what's really neat about this is we have a lot of the design process that um, document the work that Alex and his team uh, did as they were working on this project. And Alex is so wonderful as a donor. Every time we get a donation, we get a very handy list of exactly what it is, fully documented. So we have that in our files, which is wonderful. Um, so you can see uh, little bits and pieces of the design process. So <laughs> we have this. This is going to resemble, obviously, um, what you'll find at the library itself once uh, everybody's able to get back in there. Um, and I can give you a little bit of a view of that. So um, Obviously, there are a whole bunch of different kinds of things in here that we haven't even been able to get into yet because the donation just came in very recently. Um, so we have folders of mock-ups of the design. Once we're finished processing, we'll find better housing for this. Um, so we can take this little rubber band off. And you can see all sorts of materials, first floor of the design work uh, behind the Viz Studio. So we have that here. And then again, every single thing that comes our way comes with one of these documentation sheets. That's a separate project. And then over here, glass wall partition refinements. And here, Viz Studio timeline development. So this is pretty neat, actually. So we just got these. We haven't finished processing them yet. We'll end up getting them housed um, in a very permanent way. Uh, but you can see all of the little bits and pieces. This is a real interesting processing question. So I'm going to grab Linda Sellers here and put her on the spot and ask her, you know, how, how are we going to safely house these types of things? Because you have different kinds of things that all document the process. But this is intended to be a little um, you know, not flat, plus things in here that are a little bit different. So how would you yeah, approach that? So it's, it, well, it is an interesting problem, and design <laughs> collections often are because they do have things that are not just two-dimensional often. You know, they have a, a model or something. So the first thing we'll do is take the rubber bands off. I'm just really wanting to do that right now. <laughs> yeah, we don't and, like rubber bands. And leave them off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we'll look at what's in here. And um, we have some uh, folders that will fit this box pretty, um, pretty much. They're about the size of the box. So I think in this case, we'll take whatever is flat and put it in a folder or two. And um, then I think we'll put them on the box maybe with this just lying on top so that it doesn't get flattened mm -hmm. um, and just leave some space uh, and then it looks like down here we have some things that are right 
actually bigger than the box. <laughs> and we'll have to pull them out and look and see whether the best thing is to write. Ideally, they would not be folded up like this. So in these cases, another thing that we do, we don't have them here with us, is we talk with our preservation librarian to get good solutions. So we will usually work with Jamie Bradway to help us um, find the best answers to these questions. Yeah. But this just shows you, you know, a, a wonderful donation like this isn't always a simple process of trying to figure out how to house it and make it accessible in the best way. Um, but what's really neat about this as I start to look at it is it's like the brains, the thought, the process behind the final product. So that's what we do in archives, you know, especially in someone's papers. It's not just the final outcome of what we have, but all of that work sort of behind the scenes that really documents that thought process. It's right here, all of the bits and pieces really behind what uh, his vision was for the Viz Studio. So I think that's pretty exciting. Um, Shima, do you have any thoughts about this? Because a lot of times we have our graduate students, someone like Shima, who work through these problems and work through the processing project. So when you look at this, what do you see in terms of your thought process? Oh, uh, well, as you said, Isley documents uh, lots of uh, his design uh, development process, and that's really interesting to look at and uh, to look at the final pro product and make some comparison and how he reached uh, uh, those designs and how he approached his designs. But something that is interesting about his collection is that he also like keeps all his financial records, yeah. all his like office records. So it's good to have the final product, the, uh, the process, and all those papers worked all together to understand the dynamics of like design companies. Right, that's okay. great. Thank you, Shima. Any other final thoughts before we go into our next Alex Isley box? <laughs> no. Okay, we'll, we'll stop there and we'll go on the next one. Good morning, my name is Gwen Thayer. I'm the Interim Head of Special Collections here at NC State University Libraries, and with me today is Shima. Hello, everyone. I am Shima Hosseini Nassab, a graduate student in public history. So one of the really fun things we get to do in Special Collections is open new donations. So in many cases, they come via a FedEx shipment for example, this box right here. So we get to open these and sometimes we have wonderful things that we get to look at and process and make available to our researchers. Um, in this case, I have in front of me materials from Alex Isley. Isley was a graduate um, in design from the College of Design and he's actively practicing and doing so many interesting projects. And so I've cheated a little bit. I have opened this already, but typically this is how things will come. Um, and Alex Isley is a wonderful donor. He always gives us a thorough accounting of everything in the box. So very uh, organized and thorough when he gives his donations. So um, a few of these things I have opened already, but just, just to kind of let you know, it's really fun and exciting to get these new donations. Um, we've got a few um, boxes here that are um, already processed in their acid-free um, containers and what have you. But just to give you a little bit of a sense, um, there's all sorts of creative items and wonderful items that are a little bit off the grid in terms of what we normally see. Um, and Shima, you were processing a lot of this collection, right? Mm -hmm. So why don't you dig in here and tell me some of the things that you've discovered as you've been processing. So you can find many of the final products that Isley designed. So here, for example, in this box, so we have this. Uh, uh, this packet for ice cream and I will put it over here and also like some stuff from uh, Design Within Reach and these are part of Alexander Isley's holiday gifts to these companies so if I open this so you can see the thing. also we have like interesting stuff over here Let's see what this is. That's a level. Yes, this is a level. <laughs> ruler. Yeah, some design rulers over here. And I think that's pretty much. It. So obviously, since we have a college of design, these are wonderful things for the students to see, one of their own graduates and what he has um, created and the kind of work that he does out there. So let's open another box and okay. see what we have. 
See, with Alex, it's just so much fun because you just really never quite know what you're going to have here. And to have these product examples is really special and neat to have in the archive. These are also part of Alexander Isley's Holiday Games. And let's open this one and see what's inside this. So oh, wow. It's a coffee maker. It's a coffee maker. <laughs> We don't use these in the archives. These are staying in the box. But let's, um, is there, oh wow. These are espresso beans. Yeah. We are talking with preservation. We yeah. have to keep them or not. <laughs> All right, what's so, in there? Let's see. Oh. A yo-yo. Yes, a yo-yo. And we also have like a survival kit. And a ball. Okay. Wow. So again, we've already opened these and put them in their acid-free boxes, but this just gives you a taste at how much fun it is to open one of his FedEx boxes and one of his new donations. Um, you really never know what you're going to get. But um, again, thank you, Alex, for all these wonderful materials to add to your archive. And we're continually adding to this collection. So, um, and you've been processing a lot of it. So can you tell me any of the other kind of challenges you've had as you've gone through this collection? Um, or things that you've learned about the design process? Well, it's certainly interesting to look mm -hmm. at the design process and the final pro products and uh, just to look at how he approaches his designs and what's his thought process in uh, the great thing about Isley's collection that he includes all his initial concepts mm -hmm. and uh, like uh, aside from initial concepts he also has like the, his rough uh, concepts uh, like not the final products but like the steps uh, uh, before the, uh, the final uh, design so it's just interesting to look at his thought process his timelines and uh, of course his uh, financial records mm -hmm. and that he has for his um, company and just put them all together and right. uh, see his design process great thank you so we'll wrap up this video but again we have the finding aid for this collection online for anyone interested in the Alex Isley papers thank you thank you Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me this time. Um, our apologies for a little bit of a technical glitch. Um, so I'm gonna actually do the introductions again. So today we have with us um, two guests, one very special guest who is a donor to special collections here at NC State University Libraries. So I'm going to begin by introducing Alex Isley. Alex was born in Durham and attended Durham Academy. He attended NC State and also then continued on to the Cooper Union and began an amazing design career. He worked at M and Company, and then he was also the art director at Spy Magazine, which was an amazing publication of which we have some examples in his collection. Um, in 1988, he founded the Alexander Isley Incorporated Company in New York City, and then later moved his company to Connecticut. So in his career, he's done an amazing amount of things, many of which are documented in the collection. In 2014, he received the AIGA medal, which is an extremely prestigious award. So I just wanna you know, definitely focus on Alex. We also have Shima here today. Shima is one of our graduate students in history, and she helped us in special collections process this collection. Um, we have the link to the finding here, excuse me, the link to the finding aid available to you all to see, to see what's in the collection. And Shima will be asking Alex some questions um, that were inspired uh, by, you know, working in the collection, seeing what he donated and whatnot. So again, I'd like to thank Alex for joining us today and doing this kind of new experimental thing that we call Twitch. So Alex, thank you so much for your time um, and we'll see how this goes. And Shima, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And once again, Shima is one of our graduate students in public history here at NC State, also working with us in the library. So Shima, you could take it from here. Okay. Hello everyone. I am Shima, as Gwen said, uh, I'm a graduate assistant here and my job involves uh, processing archival materials and facilitating access to our collections. And I, actually one of my responsibilities is to process uh, additions to Alexander Isley papers. So uh, Alexander Isley papers includes like uh, 
design uh, uh, final products, design uh, sketches and drafts and uh, 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 development documents. And today I actually would like to ask a couple of questions from Alex about these materials. So I would like to start uh, from like the first general questions. Uh, Alex, uh, can you please talk about your design process? Uh, well, that's a good question to start with. I think my uh, design design is tricky because you need to learn a lot before you can start to figure out what the solution is going to be. So my process, regardless of what we're working on, whether it's something printed or an environmental design um, or even sound design is to ask a lot of questions and to learn about who the audience is, what they care about, what they think about, what misconceptions they might have, what kind of thoughts or ideas are we looking to convey and how do we want people to act and react? I think if you don't know all those things as a designer, when you're going in, all you're ending up with is something that maybe looks pretty or is decorative and makes you feel good, but may not really address what the problem is. And I think an important part of design, I mean, it's hard enough to make something look good and compelling, but it also needs to work. And the challenge I find is how do you make something work, um, but still be and, and be engaging and memorable and useful. So the process that I take is to determine all the objectives ahead of time. It sounds basic, but a lot of designers might skip over that part and just launch into the form making. But there's uh, two thirds of the work happens in advance before you even start thinking about what something needs to look like. Oh, wonderful. My next question is actually related somehow to the first one. And uh, we would like to know where do you get your design inspiration from? <laughs> uh, I, it's, it, it comes from everywhere. And I think it's just an old kind of story, but look at as many things as you can, read as many things as you can. I don't look at design books and design annuals uh, for inspiration, unless they're really old, but uh, I think it's important not to get sort of wrapped up into too much of what's going on uh, in your specific field, but I think it's better to try to open it up. And inspiration comes everywhere. And I write down on little scraps of paper. Some people are really disciplined and they keep a journal, but I would always be afraid I would lose that. So I write everything on scraps of paper and then put them together and, and save them and or tear things out that I see. And I've got whole walls just covered in boxes full of things that I think might be interesting. And I never really look at them again, but it's somehow the act of writing it down or tearing it out kind of imprint, in, imprints it in your brain somehow. And um, so that's a roundabout way of saying inspiration comes from, from all over the place and probably not in an, in an expected place. Excellent. So do you have any, pri uh, like, do you have your favorite project? Like what's the, what's a favorite project that you've worked on? <laughs> uh, you know, it's, I, I think maybe a, th a few things I'm glad I worked on, but every time you look at them, I think if you're any type of, uh, every designer I know, the first thing you do is look at all the things and think about all the things that you would do differently. Um, so you can always improve upon it. So I'm never particularly satisfied with the project. I think that if, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got good memories uh, from working with specific people on projects, and I think that's the, the, the best memory. But I, I mean, I always like to say that the, my favorite project is the next one because I get very excited about that. Um, but I think if you just start looking back and patting yourself on the back at things you've done, then you stop being sort of interested and interesting and ambitious. So I try not to spend too much time dwelling on things from the past, uh, other than to look at them and feel miserable about what could have been done better. Um, so for the next question, I'm going to jump in because I see some really interesting um, group questions. And so I want to make sure we get those as well. And then we'll go back to Shima because you also have a lot of great questions. But I'm noticing in the chat, some individuals are asking, um, how does Alex determine which items he'd like to send to the archive? And then kind of a similar question, uh, when you think about preserving things for the archives, what do you look out for? So I think this is a good conversation, um, sort of between Alex and myself, I've been working as the curator in this collection. And the good news is Alex knows what belongs in the archive. <laughs> so I think in almost all cases, we've been able to accept the materials that he suggested, the ones that I feel have enduring value for researchers, people can, 
um, look at these designs, whether they're students or young designers or whomever they may be. Um, I think there's a lot of um, obviously variety in the, in the audience there, but I think that there was only one item we weren't really able to accept and that's because it was food <laughs> and we were worried about bugs and other little critters running around wanting a meal. So in that particular case, it was, um, and Alex, you can talk about what this was specifically, but what we did was we took some photos of it and we can add the photos to the collection. So Alex, if you could tell me about that one particular thing, we I think we had to send back, um, but then how we kind of work through together, um, what we'll add to the archive. Sure, I, well, yes, so I think every year in our office, we do a holiday gift that has something to do with design. Uh, oftentimes maybe it's an overlooked thing that we really admire and, and package it and write a story about it in, in a unique way in order to really get recipients thinking about the power of design and communication. One year we decided to do food products that all ended up begin with the letter A. So it had little bottled absolute vodka and maybe there was an apple. I can't remember. There were probably 15 or 20 things in there. And I had one left over apricot. <laughs> Something shriveled up. I kept it because this was probably at the time I sent it to you it was about 10 or 12 years old. And I thought, well, they might like to have this. And, you know, I didn't really think about ants or, you know, <laughs> we were getting a real rodent infestation problem in my office. So I figured we'd send it down to Gwen so that I could dump off the problem. With B you. for cockroach. No, we, we didn't find any cockroaches. <laughs> no, no. But, um, but that's, so that came back after you documented it. So, uh, yeah. but other than that, I mean, I think the, the bigger question was that, you know, I, I was really flattered probably six or seven years ago and when reached out and asked if we had some things that we could donate. And I, I save everything ever since I was a little boy, I'm a real pack rat. I, I take that as a compliment. So I really don't really get rid of much stuff. And I said, be careful what you ask for, because I have everything from projects I worked on when I was five and six years old, little design projects that I made for myself and telephones that I created out of cardboard and, things like that. So I had all that stuff. And um, so I started sending down work that we had done. Some of it I thought was a little on the dry side, sort of business correspondence, paperwork, estimating forms, but she said, send, send it all. So over the last few years, I've kind of semi up to speed. There's several things that I haven't um, still sent yet, but then I try to make it a, 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 pl a plan every year or two to sort of gather and categorize and, and organize so we're not just sort of ruthlessly dumping stuff up on you and but to put it in some kind of organization and um and so that's that's how it came about so i've sent a lot of uh, sort of personal school related things um and who, who knows if that's ever going to be of interest but i'm really grateful that it's in one place and um so it's really it's a real honor to have things put in acid-free archival boxes that um I've just been sitting in my basement so yes definitely thank you it, it's not ruthless it's generous so i think that i can kind of uh incorporate another question i see here into what you're talking about now and one of the questions here is has there been an idea that you held on to through multiple projects and were finally able to implement it and before you answer that i think this kind of speaks to the fact that we try to document your process and that's why we want all of the back end stuff, right? So we have the final design product, whether, you know, whatever that may be, but the whole kind of long road that it takes to get there, I think that's a part of the documentation process. So I think maybe you can speak to this question. Has there been an idea that you held on to through multiple projects and were finally able to implement it? There, I think there are always things. I don't really try to force an idea that's, that's not natural. In fact, sometimes clients, when they come to me or they did earlier on, in my career, they'd seen something they wanted and they wanted an exact duplicate of that. And then I would have to explain, well, listen, the way that that thing looked or how, how it, what it says is a specific response to a set of problems and circumstances that you just can't apply like a lacquer on top of the, the design. But having said that, sure, there's some ideas that I thought might work for, for some uh, client and they didn't take it and perhaps in months or even years down the road, a similar set of circumstances might pop up um, and I've sort of repurposed it. I think one in particular that um, happened was early on when I was just starting my business, there was a company uh, called Edge Communications that needed a logo and I just created the letters E-D-G-E and topped it, cut the top off 
And then they got bought by another company before it even got accepted. So I had that taped over my desk. And about a year later, this chef, Bobby Flay, called up and he had this restaurant called Mesa Grill. And I used the same idea and they were staggered about how quickly I was able to come up with a solution because you know, I drew it while I was on the phone with them based on what was in front of me. It doesn't happen that often, but I would, my advice to designers is hold on to everything and maybe something will sort of pirouette to the surface in your brain where it would be appropriate. Um, so yeah, sure. I think I keep, I keep, you know, if, if something doesn't get accepted, um, I think it's okay to, if, if it's appropriate, try, try it again for someone who might be more open to it or it might it actually turns out sometimes the time it's been quote unquote recycled actually works better than the first time around. So. So before we go back to Shima, I know you have a lot of other questions you have about designing. Um, and, and since you process the question, I do see another question from the audience that I want to address. And that is, is a design eye something you have to be born with or are there ways to develop it intentionally? Uh, I, I don't think you're born with it. I think design is a skill. I mean, certainly some people have more of a sort of maybe a sensibility, a visual sensibility, but I think design is like drawing. People say, oh, I can never draw, but that's, it's a skill that can be practiced and it, it can be learned. There's a vocabulary to design. I think knowing, um, uh, ha having a sense of history, having a sense of, um, of, of learning about how different problems are solved it's certainly that that's solvable. Um, I've taught in, in the past at university level, and in some cases, they'll have someone come into a graduate program who's never studied design in their life. Um, and they will maybe go through a preliminary program. But after the three years, I would argue they're better designers than the people that maybe studied it as an undergraduate, um, which just goes to show that if you're curious, thoughtful, and have an eye or a sensibility and want to know how to apply it, uh, design, design can be learned. It's, it's, it's not a mystery. Um, that's what hey, thank you. So my next question to Alex is, how do you measure the success of your designs? Uh, well, it's, I mean, especially in graphic design, it's very typical. We have some clients that ask what their ROI is, return on investment. And there's so many, if you're designing, say, an identity or a logo for an organization, it's really hard to um, categorize that because there's so many elements that go into success. It's the way that the, the, the product or the company is, is promoted. It's, how, it's the quality of the item itself, the experience that people have, that, that design can help inform and establish, but there's so many other things that take a, a role in it and it frustrates some clients because they want to know that their business is going to go up. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's tough. Although we did uh, a couple of years ago, a retail uh, environment, a gift shop in a museum, and we redesigned it and kept the same items, same price points and sales went up 42% in the first year. So I trot that out as my ROI, which is a staggering in increase and probably I'll never duplicate anything like that again. Sometimes you can track it. You can, if you're designing a website or an email, you can track engagement. I mean, that's a little bit easier, but a lot of what we do is so slippery and we're touched, we touch different parts of, 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 of a user's experience that it, it, it's tough, you know? I mean, my, my ROI, I think, you know, at the beginning we, we, we talk about how do we determine success when we start a project? And we really try to get the clients to, to um, agree to that. And if they're looking for a dollar sales increase, I, I won't take the project on because there's so many things out of our control. Um, but usually people are understanding that that's not it. Success for me is if someone sort of smiles and claps their hands and says, Eureka, and they say, I can't believe we're paying you for that because it's so simple. My kid could have done that. I'll take that as the most ringing endorsement that we could get. So, so a disgruntled client uh, annoyed that she's paying for something that um, seems very simple and obvious. That's my that's my determination of success. Great, thank you so much. So uh, I have a little bit more specific question about your holiday gifts. So you have all these amazing holiday gifts, and can you talk about these gifts, or like that you give to your clients? 
Yeah, every year. I mean, a lot of times designers will send out things to clients and usually, I don't know, the ones I've seen are kind of is buy a bottle of wine and you design a label and stick it on there and that's it. And that's fine. It's kind of easy to do, but to me, it's, it's more interesting to create, to sort of select an object that I think is well designed and maybe gets overlooked sort of a commonplace design. For example, we did a baseball one year that we had custom imprinted. I think baseballs are beautiful design objects, two identical pieces of leather that are stitched together with these red chevron stitches and it fits perfectly in a pitcher's hand. And when you throw it, you can make a curveball or a slider and it's just as very basic. And so we'll take an object like that, or maybe it's a shoe tree, a shoe horn, or maybe it's an ice pack that you put on your head or a stapler, things that are just very straightforward and earnest and kind of overlooked and then write about why we think it's good design put it in a package that explains why it impresses us and what we think is good about it and how a good design is simple, basic, effortless and does its job and does it well. And by sending those out to current clients, potential clients, members of the press, friends of the studio, it's a way of getting our name out there, to be honest, it's a promotional item, but it also gets across some of the idea of what we value as designers and how our role in taking an idea or an object and adding to it and explaining it and reaching to a wider audience can be translated into a project that we could do for you, Mr. or Mrs. Client. So that's kind of every August, we start agonizing about what that year's gift is going to be. In fact, we had a staff meeting this morning in which we said, okay, it's almost time in a couple of months to start thinking about what, what we want to send out this year. So it's kind of, it's kind of fun. It's, it's, it's really, it's very time consuming, very labor intensive. Occasionally we'll get a recipient say, I want you to do one of those for us. Then I tell them what it'll cost because as many of the hundreds and hundreds of hours that go into it, they kind of have a stroke and say, oh, it's okay. We're just going to order a Frisbee with our name on it instead. But you know, every once in a while someone bites and we are lucky enough to be commissioned to do some of those. We did some for Design Within Reach a couple of years ago that I was very excited about because we got to write the copy, source the material, create the project, create the packaging. So it's a real all-in-one sort of, um, you know, summation of what we like about design and if we've got a good client, what the client thinks about it as well. Great. Thank you so much. So. Uh one of my other questions is about your connection with NC State. Can you talk about that? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, I grew up sort of knowing, uh, you know, being in awe of the NC State College of Design. My father went there as an architect. In fact, he was in one of the very first graduating classes. He came over from Oklahoma under Henry Camp Hefner, who founded the College of Design. So he was in the first group and he studied architecture. And so I kind of grew up hearing these stories about, you know, uh, the luminaries who had visited the college and he made things in his, uh, you know, workshop and he, he would do his drafting at home sometimes. So to me, it was very magic seeing what an architect could do. And I looked at different schools, honestly, um, cause I didn't want to live so close to home. I'm from Durham, except NC state was the only school that wanted to see your portfolio and grades. Everyone else wanted one or the other, and it was a great school. So that's, that's my connection, how I ended up there. Um, my brother, Nathan subsequently studied architecture there. So it's, it's sort of a family, uh, and, and my, my other two brothers, Malcolm and Duncan also went to NC state. So there were four boys in our family. We all went to college there and, uh, you know, my, and my dad did as well, obviously. So there's definitely a real connection and I'm grateful in subsequent years to have, to, to have NC State as a client and have done several projects there, which is a lot, a lot of fun, very rewarding. I think Alex, in your collection, we have a number of things that you donated from when you were here. Do you remember the t-shirt that you donated and a little bit of the story behind that item? Sure. I, there was a few student projects that I included and there was one time, I don't recommend this by the way, but there was one time with some colleagues and our classmates uh, realized that the way that Brooks Hall and the School of Design 
buildings were all aligned about an axis. And we thought, well, since we're setting design and we appreciate formality, we would celebrate that axis, the line that went through the buildings. So we took a wide roll of paper one night and draped it over the building and spray painted the word axis every 20 feet and had t-shirts made that we had specified. And, you know, it was an all night endeavor. We were very proud of it. Sort of, we were inspired by Christo, the artist running fence where he would do these temporary installations or write the Reichstag. And so, and then the campus police came and really threatened to arrest us or have us arrested. So they, they, and we took it all down, but it was documented. So there are some artifacts from that endeavor that are in there. Don't do this at home kids. And, um, but it, it, it was, I don't recommend climbing on the buildings, but some of those photos and uh, artifacts are in the collections of the library. So. Yeah, I remember the t-shirt and someone actually asked about the Axis stencil, which I think is from 1982. I see a reference to it in the finding aid. That's it. Um, You've got this is stencil yeah. that we use to make the shirts or, we go. And, and or the uh, stencil on the on the on the paper. So yeah, you got it now. So yeah, so it looks like the answer is yes for that one. <laughs> um, another thing. Well, there's two questions I have. We in the the video that we showed, we talked a little bit about the Viz Studio and the design process. So I kind of wanted to address that, and then perhaps if you have time, something we didn't do in the video was a little bit of your work on the 9/11 project. So, um, do you think you could speak to those two things? Sure. I think well, the Viz Studio, um, we were approached by the um, NC State Libraries and the Office of the Architect at the University to work on the renovation of the D.H. Hill Library. And we had done previously, a few, a few years before, worked with uh, some of the environmental design elements in the Hunt Library, mainly room designation, donor resignation, uh, res designation. Um, uh, so we were brought in to do work on the, the, uh, the three floors that were being updated for D.H. Hill. And it was kind of my favorite type of assignment because it was, it was a pretty wide open brief. In fact, I've worked decades to be at the point where someone could approach me and say, we not, not sure exactly what the assignment is, but we would just like you to be involved, which to me was quite flattering and also a little bit terrifying because I knew there needed to be some wayfinding signage component, but there was going to be more to it than that. So uh, we met with the groups of the people that were steering this renovation and the architects and really proposed some different ways that the spaces within the building could be activated. And one of them was this visualization studio, which is, is if you haven't been there yet or opened up, it's this sort of 360 degree presentation room that's got different cameras and screens inside where you can really, it's like a holodeck kind of uh, thing. I haven't ever been there since it's been open because of COVID, but there was this big curved wall and we thought it would be a really good opportunity, good opportunity to do some sort of installation or a mural, something of that sort in the space. And one of the ideas I had was since the libraries are about collecting, conveying, um, explaining information, what if we did some sort of timeline on the history of data visualization or data collection and dissemination and archiving to sort of talk about, not just about the visualization studio, but the libraries as a whole, one of the functions that they uh, fulfill. And so we did a lot of research over the course of a year and a half or so of just different types of from the earliest, you know, Sumerians or people who used cuneiform or maybe um, Polynesian maps that were made using twigs and seashells. How can you convey and store, communicate information? And we created this um, sort of a timeline, you know, a very edited and subjective timeline, but one that has a, a, con a continuum nevertheless. And in terms of colors, we were inspired by the mural that uh, the light mural installation in the DHL library that uh, Joe Cox had had created. I was always a fan of his work. I never really had him as a student. He did a couple of seminars. My parents had one of his paintings in our house, actually, that used the same color palette as the light installation. So I used that as the basis for the colors, and we made it kind of a serrated design so that when someone walks around it, different colors uh, kind of uh, uh, reveal themselves and different messages kind of reveal themselves as you as you walk around it. So in a nutshell, that was one of the installation elements that we created. And it's kind of a centerpiece as you come up the main stairway, you see it, um, or one sees it. I, as I said, I haven't seen it in real life, but we made lots of models. 
mock-ups, and that's what you you that, that that I have that you sent over. We actually have a really big model about four feet across on a lazy Susan that spins around. That was too big for us to send there, but I've got the some of the parts of it were, were included as well. And it was very, it was, it was very satisfying and, and fun to work on. And um, that, and, and there's another, uh, you know, there's other murals in, in the NC State campus. Manuel Bromberg did one. Um, I think it's still there. I'm not sure um, that, that, that sort of was certainly an inspiration for such a thing as well. Um, And the other, sorry, the other question was about the 9-11 um, work. Oh, um, sure. 9-11 Memorial was, it was the winner of a competition designed by Frederick Schwartz, uh, an a, very, a talented architect who sadly passed away at too young an age a few years ago. We'd done a few different projects um, with Fred and his firm, including the uh, Staten Island Ferry Terminal in New York and the Westchester County, New York 9-11 Memorial. Um, this was a, a, a design that he and his associate um, came up with that were these two parallel stainless steel walls in Liberty State Park facing New York City. And if you stood in between them at a certain point, the walls take up the exact same space that the Twin Towers did. So it was a very poetic solution. And they wanted a way of putting all the people from the state of New Jersey, there are about, I think, 814 at the time, who, who had, had passed away during that tragedy. So it was a very, it was a difficult assignment in that we wanted to find a way to present the people's names as large as possible. And they're about three and a half inch tall letters, which we believe is sort of the largest memorial inscription lettering in, in the US. I can't guarantee that, but at the time we believed it was true. And some of the names had been requested to be grouped together with either family members or coworkers and the clients were among people, others, survivors, family members. So it was very, it was an emotional and difficult assignment. I'm sure there's some scripts that one could write to lay the names out, but we all, we did it all by hand. We wanted to make sure that the letter spacing, the word spacing was all created sensitively. We wanted to make sure that people's names weren't split because there were a series of four by six foot stainless steel marine grade panels we wanted to make sure that the names didn't get split up um, in, in the middle of names on there. So there was a real, it, it was not so much math, it was more artistry. You know, how do you get the names together, everything to square up, look like it has an overall typographic color, and also leave room so that additional names can be added over the years because sadly some people still are suffering some of the results of the event, cancer or whatever that and, uh, have a, a mechanism in place so that additional names could be added if required. Okay, thank you. Sure. I noticed another question in the chat that I didn't see before. And the question is, will the pink eraser make it there eventually? Uh, um, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you'll get that, I think. Um, it's That was one of, that was our holiday gift from last year. Um, you know, COVID slowed our business down like a lot of people. We didn't have a lot of money to spend on a gift that year. And since the election was coming up, I don't want to step on any two toes, but I thought the idea of eradicating or erasing was an idea that sort of as time had come. So we actually rushed to get this gift out before the election. And it was basically this beautiful classic pink pearl eraser that we've all seen before. And I think it's just actually a really beautiful object. So we created a package and we laser engraved our name into it. It said, remove and improve. And there was a little pad that it came in that talks about how, um, you know, why we think it's a great idea and how the pink came from uh, Eberhard Favors company. It was a pencil manufacturer and how actually using raw rubber and um, pumice from Italy gave it the pink color. So it talks about the design, how it fits in your hand and also how it could have sort of a purpose. So yes, it'll make it in there. It, it actually, to be honest, it looks like this may have been added already. It doesn't say pink, but I see something here. Holiday gifts, notepad with erasure. Yeah, that's 11, it. 11, 2020. Uh, so Final box, it. 213. So we, we actually do have that already. We can update the finding aid, just call it the pink eraser. <laughs> yeah, in fact, it's just, I have, since we started talking about our project today, this is what it looks like. It comes in a box. Okay. It says, here's to improvement. And then you open it up and here is this pad you get and 
it's got the person's name on it and then it opens it up and says in honor of 2020 and that's erased so uh, there's a lot of handwork involved with this like every single person who got these 250 300 of them it talks about why it's important why we like this eraser and so there's like six or eight pages you know there's a little base on it and it talks about why this is an important design and then when you get your eraser out which makes the mat the little mouth on the guy it's kind of got the script the inscription so it's a modest little gift but the point is how do you take a commonplace uh element you know idea or, or, or object that maybe get overlooked and package it and present it and talk about it in such a way that it honors the design design is everywhere everything around you is designed and if you just pay attention to even the most minuscule like in a rubber racer that we all have you can learn something and you can also appreciate how the way that you package something shows what the power of a designer can do to communicate to people and with luck engage them so. and i just love that you just basically pulled that out of your pocket magically <laughs> i've got stuff i'm surrounded by stuff you know? so amazing. i think that to me is important a uh, whole office every nook and cranny is taken up so yes i can um, that was a sort of a magician trick that you right. had there and there's so. a quarter behind your ear look at that you know and uh so anyway that's amazing. So Alex, um, we're only with a few more minutes and I want to just do a final call out there for if there's any final questions. And while everybody out there is thinking if they have any questions, I'm going to say to Alex that, you know, this is really, you know, amazing again that you've offered all this time to talk to us and we have these amazing materials. I think really what we should talk about for the future is doing an oral history to accompany your collection and having that where we can have you talk about some of the design process and some of your favorite items in the collection. So maybe start to think about that, you know, as we move forward. And if anyone out there has uh, some ideas about kinds of questions you'd like to be asked of Alex, you know, we have about five more minutes. Um, jump right in there and let me know if you have some thoughts or questions. But um, I think that it would be a really nice addition to the collection to have that kind of reflection on all the materials that you have uh, have with us. Oh, I'd love um, to. Yeah, I wonderful. Like we're just getting started, so. <laughs> So um, are there any other questions out there or uh, Shima, did you have any final thoughts about, you know, being someone who had this opportunity to process this collection? Um, you know, again, that's a really kind of wonderful experience for a graduate student to get to have their hands into something so special and, and unique. Um, any kind of final thoughts about that before we wrap up? It's absolutely special to uh, go through like these papers and understand uh, somehow uh, Alex's thought process and like uh, to look at this uh, design development documents and see how he approaches the design and how he develops it into the final product. So for me, it was a really an uh, fortunate like opportunity to have access to those. And also it's so easy to go through his materials because he has the is amazing organizing uh, organizing uh, system with all the clients number and uh, project number so it's uh, easy for uh, an assistant in archives and special collections to go through these uh, my materials and uh, process them but also it is absolutely interesting to look at them and learn from him thanks shima and i'll let alex i'll let you if you have any final thoughts but again you know, one thing that's been so great about this collection is not only the contents, but like how meticulous you've been about organizing it and sending it with lots of descriptions. So that's made our lives really easy. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you for that. And thank you once again for spending time with us today. Um, I'll let you leave us with any final thoughts and then we'll we'll just conclude with your final thoughts. Sure, well, it's, it's just a real uh, honor that you, you're taking care of this stuff and having it in a good home. It means a lot to me. I try to be very organized because I have a short attention span. I love working on as many types of things as possible. At any one time, I might be working on 30 or so projects. So I try, I have to be organized internally. Otherwise my head would fall off. So you're the, you know, the, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that you appreciate that it's organized because sometimes I feel I'm just dumping it in a box, but that's, that's great. And I hope to be able to send you things for many years to come as long as you want them. So uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us on this final Twitch um, of the day. So thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. So long. <laughs>